It is in our DNA to explore. To find places off the beaten track. It is what draws us to places like the Kimberley and Cape York. But a few of us talk about the Great Australian Bight. It is one of the most remote, challenging and beautiful areas of Australia. A trip along its edge is a journey like no other. A plan is set to follow some of the tracks of Europe's early pioneers, like Thyssen, Ayr and Sturt. In the team are Scott Brady, CEO of US-based Overland International. This crossing of the Great Australian Bight really captures all of what we're looking for. Rob Boheim, Chief Exploration Officer from Hema Maps. Just really looking forward to this, this time with you guys. Stephen Clay from Red Ark. It is my first time camping. Can't really get enough of it. Brad from Max Tracks. I think I've got the Explorer gene. And Tim from Caravan World and Camper Trailer Australia. Going outbound is about putting yourself to the test. Hema provided a pair of land cruisers set up for remote work with added fuel capacity, onboard water, extra electrical power, and almost every piece of ARB protection and road recovery gear on sale today. Behind the cruisers are two prototype campers from the innovators at Zone RV. You might think that taking prototypes on a 9,000 km return trip that includes days off-road is a bad idea, but with Cruise Master suspension under the heavy duty chassis and practically bulletproof bodies up top, their makers are confident this torture test is the perfect intro to the new release campers. The Red Ark lads come with the most town focused of the cars, in a well set up Hilux, complete with added fuel capacity, all the battery management and solar gear you will ever need, as well as added clearance from a small lift kit and some better tyres. Brad from Max Tracks brings his favourite two toys, a highly modified 6 wheel 200 series Land Cruiser, and his Polaris UTV, and of course a suite of Max tracks, including some prototypes of his own for R&D testing. The team's journey begins in Brisbane with a quick bolt in land to Inaminka, a fast-paced run down the Strzelecki and onto the Air Peninsula where the trip is to begin in earnest. During planning, the team looked at Hema's guidebooks and maps of the route. What they showed was the gradual change from the deep coastal greens to the soft red sands of the centre, what they didn't show was the experience of driving the Great Dividing Range, or the suddenness and steepness of the climb into Toowoomba. You cannot see Australia through pictures. You have to experience it yourself. The team sets up at the Nakundra Waterhole, a popular spot for anyone towing a caravan or camper on their way inland. It is only a few hundred kilometres from Inaminka, itself only half a day from Arkarula. Ignore what Google Maps tells you, the Strzelecki can be done in a day, but be watchful for washouts and culverts. Some tested the quality suspension of the cars and campers, and tried to travel during the day, as livestock roam freely and can be hard to spot at night. Traditional country of the Antnamat people, the Volkathana Gammon Ranges to the north of the well-known Ikara Flinders Ranges are steeped with history, and like their famous cousins, are one of the best places to see the sunset. A few days in, it is a good time to reflect on how the trailers are towing and the outback conditions. I'm driving the HEMA 76 series Land Cruiser, now it's set up for touring with a heap of ARB gear on board. And I'm towing a Zone Expedition Series camper. It tows fantastically, we're about two tonnes behind us and that's easily within the cruiser's three and a half tonne tow capacity. Now off-road where it really matters, we're on Cruise Master ATX airbag suspension. I'm a big fan of ATX, I've used it a lot before. Not only can I level the camper off on a campsite, but I can also adjust the airbags to soak up bumps off-road. And I am driving uh, the, the HEMA 79. Uh, this is a vehicle that they extensively modified for overland travel, and it's always impressed me. Uh, but what I'm really impressed by is, is this Zone RV trailer behind it. We just did some pretty technical driving with rocks and steep hill climbs. I think the thing that stands out in my mind is just how well the suspension performs. So far, big thumbs up for the Zone RV. Heading down the eastern side of the Flinders Ranges, the team pushes hard to make a date with Red Ark 
a day before the new factory is set to unveil. With a new BCDC charger and Toe Pro Elite version 3 about to be released in Australia, the team takes a chance to see how they are made and to hear from the engineers about what sets them apart. Two days later and the team makes Port Lincoln. Port Lincoln is as easy to get to as any other major regional town. It has an airport, rental cars, and all the service requirements a tourer might need. It is the perfect place to start your Great Australian Bite trip. So guys, we just arrived in Port Lincoln. Effectively, we're going from the most eastern point of the Great Australian Bite, 1650 kilometer arc across to Point Malcolm on the western side. It's gonna get progressively harder as we go, but it's just an amazing part of the country. Beautiful sand dunes, awesome campsites, lots to see and do ahead of us. After the lunch briefing, the plan is to test the capability of the crew and cars on sand. We just come across this pretty awesome section of sand dunes near the beach. So I thought we'd take the opportunity to check out how the vehicle and trailer setup goes before we head a long way from civilization into the unknown. Come up the really steep part to start with, give it plenty of berries. You've got a you know, nearly one and a half ton weight behind you, going to pull you downhill. Once you've peaked over the dune, then just nice and easy down on the flat in the way. Whaler's Way on Cape Canoe is privately owned, but welcomes travellers. Call ahead to Port Lincoln Visitor Centre, pay your fees, and you gain access to one of the most stunning headlands in Australia. Officially in the bite, the crew has ticked off the first goal, seeing the Southern Ocean meet Australia. Great to be here at Cape Carnot, named in 1802 by Nicholas Bodine. This place feels like Land's End, which I think is pretty fitting given it's the most eastern point of the Great Australian Bite. Today's been pretty good. First time campus, so getting to see a whole new part of the country in a completely different way. Not many people, you know, take the time or get the opportunity to come out and see this type of stuff, so it's uh, fantastic. Up early with a big drive ahead to Bird Bay, the crew sets off, but you should take your time. Bird Bay Ocean Echo Experience takes half of the team out for an up-and-close encounter swimming with the sea lions and dolphins. One recommended to anyone interested in wildlife and the water. Jan and Feb are the best months to visit with less wind and warm water. Absolutely incredible. One of the most amazing up close and personal experiences with wildlife I've ever ever had. The more you spun around and twisted around, the more they just spun and twisted around you and played. Just mind blowing. Absolutely amazing. Near Bird Bay are Murphy's Haystacks, an old geological formation called Inselbergs. They are weathered granite, shaped by nearly 34,000 years of exposure. Just rolled into Sejuna. This is the very last main resupply point before the next 1,200 kilometres across to Esperance. That's going to be completely off grid, uh, running through a full vehicle check. It gets pretty real from here, and um, we're going to have to be pretty self reliant. Fowler's Bay is another historic stop for anyone interested. The history of whaling is on display through ruins and the long famous jetty. But for anyone keen on dune driving, it is also a good stop. The dunes are fun, but take care on them, especially when towing. I've managed to bog the Sydney 9 series in the top of one of the sand dunes from Fowler's Bay. Now I've dug it out already and I've inserted four max tracks in front of each of the wheels. Now I'm still in low range, I'm going to use second gear. What I'm going to do is I'm going to roll forward slightly, start to feel the max tracks grip. And then once I feel them grip, I'm going to apply steady accelerator, get some momentum and drive off. So we'll give it a go. The dunes are the only way to access Point Fowler. This night's stop and another spectacular example of where the limestone cliffs meet the sea. From the Fowler's Point camp, 
The team planned to get to the WA border town Eucla, travelling on unformed roads under the Cooper's tyres. But the going is slow. So the 79 stuck. These beaches are a little bit different to what we got in Queensland. So in Queensland we tend to drive close to the water's edge because it's nice and firm. But down here it's soft and it can have buried seaweed so it's quite treacherous. As you can see he's having trouble just getting up the beach. It's quite a gentle slope but it's still really soft. So the trick is to try and drive as close as you can to the dunes. That's what we normally do. You can see the track here. And if there's existing tracks on the beach just follow them. Otherwise you'll be doing this all day. And I like max tracks, but I mean, all day? Not really. Once free from the sandy captor, the crew makes the decision to adjust the route, heading back to the formed tracks with the dog-proof fence the next stop. We've headed west through the Mallee country. This fence is quite unique in that it's actually the longest fence in the world, and this fence is a dog-proof fence, or the vermin-proof fence, that stretches from here pretty much all the way back to where we've come from, over 3,000 kilometres. Just have a think about how much wire, how many poles, how many man hours and weeks and months and years of work it took to get it to this point. After a few days in the bush, an unfamiliar sight came. Paved roads. With pressure back in the Cooper's tyres, a refill at the local servo and a dash to a hidden oasis on the old national highway, Kunalda has the tired crew bedding down for the night. Yeah, I realise that we've come halfway across the Great Australian Boat. Some pretty amazing relics on the old air highway. A really special collection of some of the classic cars that would have crossed the Nullarbor and obviously didn't make it all the way across. So today we are heading to the border village uh, where unfortunately we've got to dump the rest of our fruit and vegetables. We're going to refuel at Majura and then head down a section of the old air highway and along the beach to a, a pretty special place called Twilight Cove and plan to make a camp there tonight. Majura's roadhouse gave the team a chance to unwind, refuel the bodies and cars, and turn back off the beaten track and towards the beach with a stop on the Airbird Observatory. Expected unexpected in the outback, came across a mob of kangaroos. One of them decided to um, shoulder charge the door there, so everything's okay otherwise than that. Um, really fun track, lots of, lots of narrow gaps through the trees. And one of the um, real challenges for any kind of design of anything that does a lot of outback stuff is just dealing with this bull dust. So um, I haven't opened this up, but I just want to check how the dust ceiling is going. It's the worst place for dust ceiling at the back normally. You can see the back door, pure white, like it's just been cleaned. And even in here, not a speck of dust at all. That's pretty awesome. So many layers of history in one place. Of course, there's the natural history with the, the whales that migrate through here every year, the bird life. There's layers of human history with exploration from air, settlement history, uh, of course communication history where this used to be a telegraph station sending messages all the way from Perth right through to Eucla. All packed into one tiny little museum in a really remote place. Quite amazing. From the observatory, the crew turned to the beach for an experience you'll struggle to get anywhere else in the world. The tracks and beach driving into Twilight Cove are challenging, but not insurmountable, with the right people and vehicles. We've just heard from the locals at the Airbird Observatory that there's a, a vehicle buried underneath the seaweed from about six weeks ago, so that's sort of an insight into just how treacherous this beach can be. No max tracks! That's what happens! After finding some shelter between the dunes, above the high tide line, the crew settles in for one of the best nights of the trip. That was a pretty special afternoon and with that sunset that we had, the clouds played their part and um, yeah, we rolled, rolled into this, this awesome campsite right at the perfect time. We've been incredibly spoiled every day and then I think today has been it's kind of the pinnacle of, of that. It's been overwhelming to say the least. following a lot of where air has been. We had Baxter Memorial, what's the story mate? Baxter was Air's 2IC. There was a scuffle over food and the firearm was discharged and Baxter died. The two ab Aboriginal guys scampered with the food and the rifle and Air woke up with the sound of the gunshot and ran over to see that his companion was dead. So it was left to him and Wiley to make it all the way to Albany. Enter the old telegraph track. WA's Old Telly, a well-marked track on HEMA maps and HX1 navigators. It is suitable for single vehicles, 
and maybe small trailers. The track is overgrown, narrow, and nowhere to pull over if you met another traveller. This is remote touring at its best. Tough on tyres this terrain. I don't think that band-aid's going to cut it somehow. It's a little bit <laughs> what we call bugged. So I think uh, that one's coming off. I think we might have caught a, caught a stump on the way past. You got a copy, Rob? Yeah, copy, Tim. Hey, man, how are you finding that um, airbag suspension on these corrugations? Smooth it's self okay. It's going great. Um, I found the suspension fabulous the whole trip. It seems to adapt to every kind of terrain. How's the suspension going in your trailer? Now, these coils are pretty good. I mean, they're not as smooth as the airbags when I was towing that the other day, but it did pass the no broken eggs test. I had a look before, and so far, all the food in the back is sitting nice and snug. So it's amazing what these trailers are having to endure on this trail. The high frequency vibrations of the corrugations have severed the heads on the rivets and so the, the door just fell out. Scott, you got a copy? Yeah, go for Scott. Yeah, Scott, I've just hit something. I just got to check under the trailer. Tim, what happened? Oh man, I got distracted and hit this. Whoa. Everything all right? And it looks fine. This thing's tough as nails, safe as houses. I'll reverse up a little bit, we'll pull it out and we'll check it again. That sounds good. Jeez, that is quite the rock. The challenge is taking its toll on the expedition campers from Zone RV and the crew. It is unbelievable to think air and wire had to endure it on foot. Today has been a challenging day. We're still driving and it's nearly 10 o'clock p.m. So it's taking its toll. We are hearing squeaks and rattles from these trucks that we didn't hear at the start of the trip. Um, but, but this is also why we're here. This is it's because they are challenging and they are difficult. And that's the reason why others don't come here. This is why we're adventurers. If you search for Bill Bunyard Dunes online, you get a couple of outcomes. But the ones to take your breath away are those between Point Culver and Point Lorenzen. They look as tall as skyscrapers and never-ending. Here, the team takes the time to work with the pros from Red Ark to assess the vehicle's charging systems and to add a bit of juice using solar blankets before another night in the dunes by themselves. From Bill Bunya, there are a couple of options to get to Point Malcolm. The team chooses the harder and more spectacular option, the coastal route. At Israelite Bay, the team stops at the old telegraph station, a spectacular set of ruins. They must have been quite something in their day. A short drive further on Point Malcolm track, and the crew made it. It's been a long way to get here. We've seen some of the most amazing scenery any of us have ever seen. All the trucks, especially the trailers, have made it through. To get the experience of the confidence to drive across pretty much anything with the crew and, and just experiencing things that normal day-to-day -day life you're not going to experience. Just being out in the wilds, and the more remote and the wilder the better for me. I'm surrounded by some really good people, some pretty impressive equipment as well. Really enjoyed it. Remote locations, long distances. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here and to have experienced this beautiful part of Australia. The team did it. Over 5,000 kilometers from Brisbane, following the footsteps of some of our greatest explorers, they saw the best the country has to offer and had it almost all to themselves. For anyone looking for the ultimate remote tour, it is one of the best.